Welcome into the LSU Sports Insider. Today is Tuesday, September the 17th. I'm Zach Ewing with Koki Riley and Wilson Alexander. Actually recording this on a Monday evening, uh, but by the time we're talking to you, it'll be Tuesday. And we're going to recap some LSU South Carolina. I, I don't know if that game makes any more sense 48 hours later or... Uh, or if you can ever make sense of it, but we'll try, <laughs> and we'll we'll uh, we'll talk. We'll kind of re- take take a, a stock of LSU season three games in, kind of the end of the I would say the first stage of their season. They go into a period now where they have two very winnable games, then a bye week, um, and then Ole Miss. So that's the next big thing, and and we'll turn the page to UCLA as well. I uh, want to let you know that the LSU Sports Insider is brought to you by Waste Pro. Tiger fans, if you're planning a tailgate or event, keep your guests comfortable with portable toilets from Waste Pro. Call 225 744 6400 and mention the LSU Sports Insider for a special offer. Uh, he's Wilson Alexander and Koki Riley. They're the LSU beat writers. Wilson, you were in Columbia. And um, just as a neutral, like as, as an objective observer, Hell of a game to watch. It was a great atmosphere. I mean, South Carolina packed out their stadium. Uh, Sandstorm pregame was uh, cool. I mean, they were just really excited and hyped for that game. And they were even, it was weird. I was all of a sudden, like, kind of in the fourth quarter, I'm like, why are there so many people who look like they're leaving? Because all of a sudden, the, the upper deck started kind of emptying out. And all these people are going down the, the ramps. I'm like, what's happening? And then you see that they're all starting to sort of uh, head down toward the field toward their hedges and like just stack up behind the hedges because they were getting ready to rush the field if they won. And then um, that fourth quarter was just crazy. Back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Um, as I sort of mentioned to y'all before the show, I'll make the same reference. Uh, I realized later it was like Michael Scott going, snip, snap, snip, snap, snip, snap, like in <laughs> the office. Because, you know, LSU had a chance to put it away and almost blew it, but the defense bailed out the offense a few times uh, with those turnovers in the fourth quarter, gave them a chance. They end up finally capitalizing in the red zone and getting a really Really much needed win um but the atmosphere was awesome williams bryce you know that was probably you know that was the first time game day had been there in 10 years they had a lot of momentum coming off their win against kentucky and so it was a really hard place for lsu to go and play and um they definitely while there's a lot of concerns still on this team that we'll get to it was being able to win in that environment um is a good thing for this team yeah they, they, you even had the snip snap on the same play where you know, <laughs> Nussmeyer throws what looks like a pick six that yeah. probably seals the game. Oh, no, there's a flag. And, yes, it's a pick, but it, South Carolina's backed up in their own end, and LSU still has life. And, I mean, the next time that you watch a game where you don't have a rooting interest, keep in mind that the people who do have a rooting interest are probably having heart attacks. Yeah. <laughs> yeah um, again, this game was all over the place, and I, I – thought there was like a point in the early in the second half where I thought oh I mean LSU is not only you know cut this game to one score as they did heading into the second half but it looked like they really had control the game because of what was going on with South Carolina's offense and not having Lenora Sellers out there and just how limited they were offensively especially with when it came to throwing the ball um, but you know, South Carolina had the had the massive run with Raheem Sanders. Uh, there were the turnovers, the, the the botched snap, and like enough. And the the chaos just continued from the first half, and uh, that lengthened out the game. It was over four hours long, and it also uh, created a very entertaining finish. So, uh, what I, you know, it's the perfect platform to break it all down. Yeah, it's like one of those epic movies that doesn't seem like it's ever going to end and you can't tell the next twist that's coming and finally it ended south carolina missed a field goal lsu hangs on they're two and one um we're going to take a quick break and we're going to continue our breakdown and, and like i said kind of take stock of of where the tigers are at heading into the next phase of their season so uh, we'll see you in 60 seconds Fellas, it's clear why Caesars brought us together. This is the ultimate quarterback roundtable. Uh, I think I know why we're here. What? Quarterback, high school, Oklahoma. I thought that was a musical. Garth, I think you're here because when people use Caesars Sportsbook, they earn with Caesars rewards. Things like celebrity chef dining, Vegas vacations, even tickets to your show. This app is over the top. There's the idea. Hit me! Bet with Caesars Sportsbook. Earn Caesars rewards and see your favorite quarterback, Garth Brooks, in concert. Hey, you can't throw like that. You know how far I've gone, now I'm home again. I'm feeling more alive these days than I've ever been. At the Baton Rouge Clinic, our sole focus is to provide exceptional health care for your entire family so that you can get back to doing what you love most. We are caring for generations. You give me All right, so LSU is 2-1 and one after surviving South Carolina 
33. And they get two home games, as I mentioned, against UCLA and South Alabama the next two weeks. They're going to be big-time favorites in both of those games. In fact, we'll, we'll talk about the UCLA betting line a little later with Thomas Casale. Uh, and then they get a bye week. So there's kind of this natural... I don't want to say breather. I don't, you know, it's not like LSU's I would not going to breather. Well, LSU's <laughs> not going to take these games unseriously. Like they're still going to, they're still going to take them seriously. But it is a chance. Like there's an obvious next benchmark that you're that you're heading toward, right? Absolutely. It's Ole Miss on October 12th. LSU. This is a look. I, I guess the reason you can't quite say breather is because this is not an LSU team that can just go out and dominate an opponent yet. At least it doesn't look like that. That's, I think that's what the Nichols game proved, is if they mm-hmm. just go out there and roll the ball out there, then all of a sudden things can get a little bit more uncomfortable than you want. But this is a UCLA team that has not been good. I mean, first-year coach, um, you know, kind of moving on from the Chip Kelly era, they uh, barely beat uh, Hawaii, but then they just got absolutely smoked at home by Indiana. Um, and then, you know, South Alabama is a team that's, you know, not on LSU's level in terms of speed, physicality, and all that. Now, they had a really good offensive output a few years ago, a few, two weeks ago. I think they scored, what, this, 87 this points? This past week, they scored 87 points against yeah. Northwestern State. Right. But this is still, like, again, teams that LSU should be able to handle. So I think that this these next few weeks become about fixing their own issues um, in order to be able – to compete with an Ole Miss team that has been really impressive to start the season, although they haven't necessarily played the same caliber of opponents that LSU has to this point. Um, you know, LSU has a lot to work on between now and then, and everything pretty much over the next three weeks starts to point toward a stretch of the season. It really is the Ole Miss game, but it's also the three other games right after that. Mm-hmm. Going to Arkansas is not going to be easy. Going to Texas A&M is not going to be easy. By a week and then coming back home to Alabama, pretty much the season gets decided within that stretch, and LSU has to be ready for it. Yeah, and and I don't I don't know that anyone would say they're ready for it right now, Koki. Like it doesn't seem they they have this these three weeks now to get ready for it. Yeah, um, it's hard to say that they're totally ready for it when you look at some of the turnovers, look at some of the missed tackles on defense, the big plays that they gave up in that game defensively. Um, you know, the holes in the secondary that we've been talking about for over for what a year and a half now. Um, I it's. It, yeah, I mean, I mean, this is still a, a, like a flawed team, and uh, it, it's uh, they've got a lot to work on heading into the South Carolina, heading into this uh, Ole Miss game, I should say. So that, that's kind of a look forward. Now, if we if we take a look back, compare how you feel about this team now to how you felt preseason. How how has your opinion changed, either in a positive or negative way, Wilson? Well, coming into the South Carolina game, I said a win is not going to change really. I think public opinion of this team. I'll add the caveat that if they had gone out and dominated South Carolina, then the public opinion would have changed about this team. But they didn't. Uh, They continued to have a lot of the same issues that we kind of saw against USC in the season opener, where, you know, inside the five-yard line twice in this game, not being able uh, to punch it in. Um, You know, Brian Kelly talked today or on Monday about, you know, leaving points out on the field. Well, LSU needs to get better at executing within the five (laughs) (laughs) because they had the same problem against uh, USC. Um, You know, and like you said, Koki, like with the with the run defenses, that Lenora Seller seventy uh, five yard touchdown uh, was way too rem- reminiscent of Colin Guggenheim the week before ripping off a sixty seven yard touchdown right up the middle against LSU. LSU has now allowed three touchdowns over sixty yards on the ground. No other team, half the team and half the leagues in the S, excuse me, half of the teams in the SEC haven't even given up a run over thirty yards to this point. And LSU has already given up three touchdown runs over 60 yards. Um, so there's a lot for them to, to clean up. And so my my opinion of the team really hasn't changed. I said coming into the year that this was a team that was going to have to go and win a bunch of close games. We've seen them play two close games. And as Brian Kelly hit the nail on the head post game, saying, you know, one of those games they didn't finish off, the other one that they did. And they're going to have to continue to get a lot better if they're going to be able to win in those close games because they are putting themselves – in bad positions uh, early on. They're falling behind in games. Um, it, it certainly against you know USC they did, against uh, South Carolina they did. Even going back to the Wisconsin game in the bowl game, they fell behind in that game. So they need to get off to a faster start on offense and, and clean up so many parts of their execution. I would say I feel better about like defensive tackle has not been as much of a glaring weakness as I thought it would be coming into the season. I still, It's not a strength necessarily, but they've played solid. Um, and you've gotten some good things out of your edge players, but the offensive line has maybe been a little bit underwhelming. And so I still feel like this is a team that's going to go probably somewhere between eight and four or 10 and I don't think they're going 10 and two, eight and four, nine and three. 
um, and uh, it doesn't hasn't really changed it at all. Yeah, it's 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 a little weird, um, Koki. I think it feels like some of their weaknesses aren't as weak as we thought maybe they were, but some of the things we thought would be strengths aren't as strong as we thought they would That's be. That's a good way of putting it. And so it's like maybe I, I don't know. General opinion is half half a step lower than it was say the day before the USC game. But what do you say? Yeah, it's uh, I, there's certain aspects of the team where I feel like my opinion has changed, like with you know Caden Durham all, uh, suddenly becoming potentially the number one running back, and you know s- stuff like that, and stuff with even with the offensive line where it's like ever, heading into the season we thought this offensive line would dominate the season. We haven't quite seen that through three games. Um, I, I look back at the numbers they played. Uh, they played better against Seth Carolina's pass rush than I remembered them playing at least according to PFF. Um, uh, Dylan and Stewart only had one pressure all game. Uh, Kennard had a sack and three pressures. He, he had the most success out of all their out of all their edge rushers. Uh, but I, I, I'd say like overall, they haven't dominated on, on that side. I, pass the pass protection has been, has been I, I think pretty good overall. But the run blocking hasn't been quite there either. Um, I, I think like that's like that's probably like everything that's gone on with the running game. I thought I think we thought there might be some issues given the fact that where they were transitioning from Jaden. Daniels over to Garrett Nussmeyer and that really just changes all the dynamics with your running game and how you have to approach the running game and the cre- the extra creativity, the extra step in creativity you have to take when you don't have that easy button in Jaden Daniels as a runner, um, that threat that Daniels brought, uh, but I don't think we thought they would struggle this much but well, I, I also, and we really didn't think Caden Durham would potentially be the answer to that, so I think those are sort of the things that, because I think defensively like I like They've improved in some aspects, but in the aspects in which they've improved were things that we thought they could improve heading into the year, like the creative blitzes from Blake Baker, um, uh, I, you, you know, just some of the more aggressive aspects to the secondary, like all these aggressive tactics that they've really brought on and that, and that have worked really for the, the – if anything's worked defensively, it's been those aggressive uh, tactics that we talked about so much and all the blitzing. Um, but, you know, there's been some minor things defensively, but for, like, for the most part, and I, I'm glad – Wilson mentioned the, the defensive tackles because that's probably been another thing. Uh, but for the most part, I, I, I think in the wash, it's more or less the same what we thought this team would be, but maybe maybe like a half step like lower in terms of execution than we thought they would be. Because I think heading into the year, we thought they beat USC, they beat Nichols by a lot, and they would beat South Carolina handedly. That did not happen. They lost to USC, they, they, they struggled at times against Nichols, and then they barely beat South Carolina. So um, it, 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 there's things that I can be very positive about in terms of things that they've improved on, but there's also things I can point at to being like, okay, uh, that's not quite what we thought it was going to be. Yeah, they've, they've been a little underwhelming at times, I, th- I think. Yeah. But but it's also fair to mention that the previous two years, and this is a credit to Brian Kelly and his staff, they've been a much better team in the second half of the season than they were in the first half of the season. And and that's the hope, is that they can fix some of those things and improve and kind of round into shape when they do get to the stretch you were talking about, Wilson, that starts with Ole Miss, that ends with Alabama. And, and you could even go farther than that and say it goes all the way through the end of the season and playing Oklahoma. Like, it, it doesn't get a whole lot easier. No, it doesn't. Um, it, maybe, you know, Florida Vanderbilt there in November before the Oklahoma game won't be too challenging going on the road to Florida this year. Looks like, you know, LSU might even be able to, I guess, extend that streak to what would it be? Six straight wins potentially. We'll, we'll talk about that in a, in a bit. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and then, um, you know, you get Vanderbilt at home. So it's, it, to me, it's really that four game stretch, but it does go all the way through the year. You bring that up, though, and it's interesting just sort of talking about like kind of where LSU is at a, as a program. The last two years, uh, you know, our opening the season with a loss wasn't um, ideal. Nobody was happy with it, um, but it was like, okay, you're still really early in the Brian Kelly era. Now you're at year three and you're still having these same problems coming out of the gate at the start of the season where you're having to work on a whole bunch of things and try to clean things up. And especially when we start to talk going into like year four and, and, the, and then the back half of, you know, Brian Kelly's first contract, it would be about getting this team to a place where right out of the gates they're executing at a high level um, because they haven't yet. And then now, you know, it's kind of interesting stat. Before Brian Kelly came to LSU, there was one season in LSU history, uh, 1961 with Paul Dietzel, where they had lost their opening game and gone on to win 10 games that season. Mm. Diesel was the only one. Kelly is now trying to do it for the third year in a row. And so it just feels like you're constantly scrambling in yeah. September to try to get things back on track. You also play more games now than you that's that Paul true. Diesel yeah. did too. But, but yeah, your, your point is well taken. Yeah. Well, there's a lot of years there where they lost their season opener and then they went on to have bad seasons. And they've been able to your point, like put 
things back together and kind of patch things mm -hmm. up in order to end up having like solid years. But now they're once again scrambling to try to to win 10 games and to still try to get into the college football playoff. And that's the thing about the South Carolina game um, in terms of the big picture LSU stayed alive in that race. I still don't feel like any of us feel confidently that they're going to make the college football playoff, um, but they at least stayed alive by beating South Carolina. And to your point, Zach, in terms of things you want to, uh, like Im improvements that you saw in the South Carolina game that could translate into, you know, a better team down the road. I thought the offense in the second half really found its footing and that's a really good South Carolina defense. They have they have big boy athletes on that team. Um, that's they probably have some, the they have Sunday players. Yeah, they have Sunday <laughs> players, and I, I would say their athleticism was even was even greater than USC's, even if USC was more disciplined at times. Um, and and, and it, it, I thought both units were pretty well coached. And the fact that after those first three drives, they moved the ball pretty easily um, from that from, from that point forward against the defense with those sort of horses. That's pretty impressive. Um, and and I thought Garrett Nussmeyer made some Sunday throws. Uh, there, oh, was yeah. the, there was the one in cut to Aaron Anderson where he had to lay it over the linebacker 20 yards downfield while getting hit in, in his legs. And it was just just a very, very, very impressive play. And, and when Nussmeyer can make plays like that and you can get the running game going, so you're creating that consistent threat from, down, from a down-to-down -down scenario, you're putting yourself in good down-to-distance scenarios, um, you're putting yourself in better scenarios to uh, open up defenses in terms of coverages when you're running the ball well and then you also already have that that the threat of you know being able to create plays downfield with Lacey and Anderson and all the weapons that you have you don't even have Chris Hilton healthy yet like it's it's if they can get if this running game is real and this Caden Durham thing is is a real uh, step in the right direction for this running game then the, the offense is going to be a, a top probably a top 10 unit again in college football because of uh, of if they can do that against that team when they're not even fully optimized in terms of what we think they that they can do you have to feel good about them even when they face an, an Ole Miss or an Alabama yeah that's the key though it's just going to be continuing to get to a point where you can clean up those little things to take that step and yeah. not just go through the rest of the year kind of stagnating in this place of poor execution and, and key spots, especially down near the goal line. Uh, if LS you can get to a point where it's finishing in the red zone, then yeah, they, they would have, you know, potentially hung 50 on South Carolina. So like they, they just have to get to that little point. There's all these little things you got to clean up. And what we have to now see the big question is, can they do that within the course of a season? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think it, it could end up being a pretty good win, honestly. Like you talk about some of South Carolina's athletes, uh, it, it reminds me a little bit of the Missouri game last year. I don't think South Carolina's going to finish top 10 like Missouri did, but they are good. Uh, we saw what they did to Kentucky the week before, and then Kentucky goes toe to toe with Georgia Saturday night. I, South Carolina's going to win some games. Like that's a bowl team, that's a seven and five, eight and four team potentially. That, that LSU went on the road in a tough environment and found a way to win. So let, let's drill down. We'll revisit the South Carolina game um, just, just for a couple more minutes before we move on. And uh, one of the things we talked about on Thursday's podcast, Wilson, with you and Rab, was the keys to the game. And the keys to the game segment is proudly sponsored by Associated Grocers. Join our team and support the success of local independent retail grocers. Apply today for available positions at Associated Grocers. Um, the weird thing was LSU won, and I don't know that they hit a lot of the keys of the game that we <laughs> talked about. Like, we talked about getting off to a fast start. Nope. Uh, did, definitely did not happen. Uh, we talked about winning the turnover battle, which is a key to any game. They did win the turnover battle, but uh, that was shaky. That, yeah. that was <laughs> snip snap again, right? Um, it was hard to keep track of who won the turnover battle by the end of the game yeah. because there were so many turnovers. You know, and, and then we talked about the line of scrimmage, and at times I thought they, they won the battle at the line of scrimmage, but uh, at other times... When they needed a yard, they couldn't get a yard. And, like, there were just – I think if you – if we had gone through that keys of the game segment on Thursday and said, nope, they're not going to do this, this, or this, it would have been hard to imagine them winning the game. Yeah, no, absolutely would have been, been hard to imagine. I think the thing that kind of did it was that they were able to – maybe settle in a little bit more on the line of scrimmage. Like Cookie mentioned, I mean, LSU only gave up two sacks. And yeah, pressure, so Nuss was pressured nine times on 42 dropbacks per pro football focus, so that wasn't quite as bad as what I thought it was during the game. Yeah, and, and that was a South Carolina team, like we talked about, that was top 10 nationally in sacks and tackles for loss coming into the game, and Stewart and Kennard were these really good edge rushers, and they had some success early, and it felt like LSU kind of like 
withstood the punch and was able to kind of settle in. Um, they were having some trouble on their blocks getting up to the second level. South Carolina's linebackers, basically they, when they would notice like a pulling lineman, would just come downhill and shoot a gap. Um, and that was really, I think, stalling the run game. LSU, it seemed like maybe went to some more zone uh, running in the second half in particular and was able to have some more success with that. And then Caden Durham did a fantastic job of sort of noticing where the where the gaps were, where the holes were, and then bouncing things outside because uh, South Carolina kept sort of like coming, you know, uh, really toward the middle, I guess, between the tackles. And, and yeah. he was able to bounce that, that stuff out to, to pick up some big gains. And so I think in that respect, they were able to do enough to win on the line of scrimmage um, because, um, you know, if they had played like they did on the line of scrimmage, like for the first, you know, 17 minutes of this game the whole way through they would not have they would not have won i mean that's why they a big reason they were down 17 nothing and why the offense punted on like his first three possessions um is because they were not winning up front but they sort of settled in and figured out some things to to do against that south carolina front to win up on the line of scrimmage and on the defensive side i mean Braden swinson with three sacks Savion jones had a sack um Paris Shan had a tackle for loss. You know, they dialed up some blitzes with like Sage Ryan, uh, you know, coming in and, and Harold Perkins coming in to force a fumble. Um, so I feel like they they did it. Uh, we'll talk about how they didn't on the line of scrimmage do a great job stopping the run, <laughs> um, but they were able to make some key plays, especially to get off the field on third down. The one thing that's really been interesting about LSU's run defense, and I, I listened to the, the, the keys of the game segment that you guys had on Thursday and uh, sort of put together some math. I'm not very good at math, so hopefully these are right. <laughs> um, so South Carolina had those two rushes of over 65 yards, but if you took away those two rushes, they, they, they gave up, uh, 102 yards on 39 carries which ends up uh, which ends up being 2.6 yards per carry so they had two massive mistakes that cannot happen and you don't get to take those away i'm no, not, not no, saying you should don't. take those away but when brian kelly compliments the defensive tackles there's a reason why he's doing that and when he's when he's talking about why he's not you know fretting over the run defense there's a reason why he's not fretting because on the whole, when you look at the vast majority of the run uh, run de- runs the run defense snaps that they had in this game, they played very very well against a very tough running team um, that has a, two running not one but two running quarterbacks, yep. and then Raheem Sanders is very tough to bring down. But uh, but at the same time, I mean the other side of that coin is one South Carolina couldn't really throw the ball, so it was much easier to stop the run, especially in the second half uh, when that was going on, and two. You can't give up two 65 plus yard runs. You no. just can't. Yeah, yeah, like on the Raheem Sanders uh, 66 yard touchdown there in the second half, um, you know, LSU, like Gabe Relliford shot a gap to and basically to make the run bounce outside to West we- Whit Weeks. And Whit got, I guess, he over pursued inside and then he got sealed off. And, um, and that's kind of how the play is designed, I think, to go is for him to be there to make a tackle and he was out of position. And so, you know, and that's kind of what's ha- probably happened on some of these big bus play runs is that, you know, they aren't having guys fit the run the way that they need to, especially, I think, at the linebacker position. And so moving forward, when we talk about things to clean up, like that's a huge thing. There's probably, you know, for football games, in general, I think are always like this where it's like, oh, you can identify like, I don't know, four to six plays where if you do something a little bit differently, maybe the score is a lot different um, or, you know, if LSU does. But really in this game in particular, like, yeah, you clean up a few things on like down at the goal line and on those big run busts and you probably win this game by two touchdowns. But that's where LSU is as a team is it's not doing those things yet. And that's what it has to do over the next three weeks. It's not that the team isn't talented enough. It's not that they're not playing with enough physicality. I think this game proved that on on both sides of the ball, and especially defensively. It's it's a it's a mental thing. It's a discipline thing. It's fit, fitting in your gaps when you need to fit them in. It's tackling. You know, um, they did not tackle very well in this game. At least that's what I thought uh, defensively. Um, and I, I again, it's just it's it, it's really th- th- those are the sort of things that you need to be able to clean up. Like you cannot give up two. 65 plus yard runs in the run in the run game even if you play so well on the 39 other rushes that that were uh, that happened throughout the game yeah i mean i I guess the good news is it's maybe it's easier to fix that as damaging as those 65 yard runs are it'd be it'd be a different story if you were giving up six yards of carry and it was because you were giving up four eight six ten yeah four six and, and and like you just didn't you can't fix that if you're just getting beat on every single play if you're performing well 90% of the time and you just have two huge blow-ups, yeah, that, you don't get to take those away, but may, maybe that's a fixable problem. Yeah, so. when you're giving up four, six, eight yards, that might 
point more towards oh you might not have the personnel to do this which that's a that's a that, that's, that's a problem a, you can't yeah. really fix you know yeah. that's hard much harder to fix but when you're giving up two giant plays and doing fairly well the rest of the time against a team that runs the ball pretty well um uh it, it, then then the suggestion is okay these are mental things that we can fix in practice Right. Uh, Tiger Fans Associated Grocers is hiring. Join a team committed to the success of independent retail grocers. Apply today at Associated Grocers and be part of something great. Uh, one more order of business for the South Carolina game, and that is our star player segment. It's proudly sponsored by Waste Pro. Ensure your tailgate or event is a hit with a clean and convenient portable toilet from Waste Pro. Rent yours today. And we could have gone. A lot of different ways. You mentioned Braden Swinson. He was SEC Defense Player of the Week, I saw, right? Yes. But yeah. So we could have easily gone with him. Uh, Koki, we went with Caden Durham. And, I, I mean, I think for a freshman to do what he did at a time when LSU really needed him to do it, um, that that's why he's our star player. Yeah. Uh, Brian Kelly was ex- – and Wilson alluded to this. Brian Kelly was explaining his press conference today how uh, South Carolina's defensive tackles did a really good job of just, like, pinching on the inside and really mucking up those holes in the interior. And they needed, they needed a running back who could recognize that, bounce it outside, break a tackle or two, and – get 10 12 15 yards and that's what Caden Durham did and uh his vision was the reason why they got their that was maybe the sole reason why they got their run their run game going in this game and uh and that's something that you'd like to see Josh Williams and Caleb, and Caleb Jackson potentially improve on or just try to find a way to work around is they, they did not they have not shown the, the sort of vision and patience that Durham showed in, in the South Carolina game through the first three weeks of the season those two guys in particular and uh, because we know we've seen them succeed at, at I mean we've seen Josh Williams be this team's number one running back two years ago and be a contributor last season uh, we saw Caleb Jackson have highlight real plays last year uh, so we know that they have it in them as runners physically it's just a matter of you know getting those guys up to speed with their vision uh, with the way that, that Durham was able to you know bounce out plays and, and, and sort of make a play uh, despite facing again a really good defense just to add to what Caden Durham did real quick according to pro football focus broke seven tackles had 50 mm-hmm. of his 98 yards after contact all right Wilson put you on the spot assuming they are they're all stay healthy because that would obviously change the equation but if they all still help stay if they all stay healthy say that 10 times fast which LSU running back has the most carries between now and the end of the season. Oh man. Uh, It's like, do you want to go off of what you just saw recently or what you, um, I mean, yeah, I guess you have to say Caden Durham because he's the one who's gone out there and really proven it. I mean, you know, Josh Williams, I think could have a chance to be up there, but at this stage of the season, you just haven't seen enough out of Caleb Jackson to feel like it's going to be him. Uh, he's got to play a lot better. lsu has got to block better for him at times, too. But, you know, he had that one run where he bounced it out to the outside and, and picked up a nice gain against South Carolina. It's like, oh, hey, they, maybe there's something. And But it wasn't as consistent like as Caden Durham was. And so if LSU feels like it can rely on Caden Durham, then, yeah, I guess it'll be him, maybe him at the end of the year. I thought coming into the season, I, I know I said this multiple times, and it uh, has not proven to be true, is that you know I thought Caleb Jackson, if LSU was going to have a 1,000-yard rush, I think we him. all thought he'd be the breakout I know. guy. Yeah. And he just, he just hasn't looked as physical. Uh, he hasn't looked as explosive um, as he did when he got some touches last year. And so um, because of what we've seen through three games, I, I would have to say Caden Durham at this moment. Wilson, there's one there's one quick question I have that I'm kind of curious to see what your answer is. So if the linebackers are are flowing down, uh, are immediately flowing down on any potential handoff for LSU, and the defensive tackles are pinching in and making it very hard for you know the offensive line to create holes in the running game because you know Nussmeier isn't a threat to run himself every every time they do a handoff. What, what do you think are some potential solutions to sort of fixing that sort of like that uber aggressive problem that defenses are posing them? defensive uh the first thing that comes to mind is wide receiver screens i thought that was going to be a much bigger part of this offense and that we have not seen it um because we saw them practicing it throughout the offseason spring ball and then again in the preseason where they would be getting the ball out to the perimeter pretty quick and so i know it's in there i know it's in that playbook (laughs) and we just haven't really seen it used very much but i would say probably that getting the ball out to the perimeter quickly that being said, Brian Kelly has, you know, said after the Nichols game that they checked to a lot of quick passes or checked to a lot of throws, and I think he specifically said there was four where they kind of got the ball out to the perimeter quick um, because Nichols was stacking the box. Um, I would say that that's probably the thing. More, more 
those sort of bubble screens, wide receiver screens uh, as an extension of the run game. Yeah, those RPO bubble screens, those RPO slants. I mean, we even saw that with the Kyron Lacey touchdown. That was an RPO because the, the reason why I say RPO specifically is because at least you, you're you it's just another option when you're uh, when you're potentially handing off the ball, it's just another option other than just handing off the ball, right? And if you can get that, you know, the quick, and if the linebacker's crashing in and the middle of the field's open, and then that's where you get Kyron Lacey on that easy slant, and you saw that for the touchdown. And if you run that play, and if, you, if that becomes like a real feature within your offense, then those linebackers are going to have to stay home a little bit more. They, they can't crash down as easily, and potentially it creates up more uh, lanes in the running game as well. Uh, all right. Uh, Quickly, today's injury report, which is brought to you by Baton Rouge Clinic. Um, some key players who missed the game Saturday, but besides the guys who were out for the season, of course. But but Chris Hilton missed again. Uh, Deshaun Womack missed again. And, and Jordan Allen was out. Um, they did get good news, I guess, on Zy Alexander. What other updates did we get on injuries? Uh, nothing really today. Brian Kelly was asked for an injury report, and he all he said was that they had a like clean bill of health coming out of the game um kind of uh avoided the question and this week he doesn't have to put out an availability report three times before the game like he did because it's not an yeah, SEC, it's not game. An SEC game um yeah. but what we know at this point is he kind of indicated Deshaun Womack will come back after missing this game uh we'll have to see on Jordan Allen Kyle Parker already returned as we know um and uh, Hilton, we just we just kind of have to wait and see. It's sort of this week by week thing with pain tolerance, like we said. And and you know maybe this is the week, maybe it's not. Um, as I said, kind of last week, it's like just sort of be patient on it, and um, you know we'll keep asking. But you know I, I don't know that there's a hard timeline on his return. But with Zai, the, the key thing with there was you know you saw him go down there in the second half. Um, but Brian Kelly said it didn't have anything to do with his knee. That it, uh, it was just a I got the thing, wind knocked out of him basically. Yeah, and that, that's good news. I I, I do think Koki probably. They'd, They'd like to get Chris Hilton out there in one of these next two games so that he, he's got his feet wet before Ole Miss. Yeah, absolutely. And um, another field stretcher won't hurt for this team because I, I will say Aaron Anderson's ascension in general has been a pleasant surprise for LSU this season. But uh, the, the fact that they're targeting him at, as far down the field as they are is a bit of a surprise as well because he's not a big guy, right? I don't think he's even six feet tall. But I oh, know he's like five eight. Yeah, yeah. But his but his speed and his ability to separate has, has been enough for um, the turning to turn him into sort of a deep threat target as well. So you have him, you have Kyron Lacey, obviously. Uh, they've been trying to get Shelton Sampson more involved like he even played a little bit in this game against South Carolina but he I, I still don't think he has a catch yet in his collegiate career um, but you know having Hilton as another deep threat option for them uh, why not right like the more the merrier uh, this receiving core is already really really strong and it's only going to get better if Chris Hilton's Chris Hilton is available all right, today's show is brought to you by the Baton Rouge Clinic, your trusted health care provider in the heart of Baton Rouge. Whether you're in need of primary care, specialist services, or urgent care, the Baton Rouge Clinic has you covered with a team of dedicated and experienced professionals. Visit BatonRougeClinic.com to learn more or to schedule your appointment today. The Baton Rouge Clinic, caring for generations. And with that said, we're going to take our last break. Uh, when we come back, we'll go around the SEC. We'll do our sports betting segment. We'll turn the page to UCLA. Back right after this. Since 1988, Classic Industrial Services, Inc. has led the industry in specialty contracting. From thermal insulation to scaffolding, coatings and beyond, we cover it all. Every minute matters in our commitment to quality and safety. We're here to serve with roofing, siding, heat trace and refractory services. Visit ClassicIndustrial.com for more information. All right, welcome back to the LSU Sports Insider Podcast. I did want to say, you, one of you mentioned Jaden Daniels earlier. Congratulations, Jaden Daniels, his first NFL victory yesterday. The Washington Commanders beat the New York Giants. Um, Malik Neighbors and the New York Giants. Yeah. yeah, Malik Neighbors still looking for that first NFL win. 
Jaden Daniels, by the way, the commanders did not punt in that game at all. They only had seven possessions. They had kicked seven field goals. I've never seen anything like it. I think it was, I, I thought I saw a stat somewhere that was like, it was the first win in NFL history where a team didn't score a touchdown and gave up, and gave up three touchdowns. Yeah, and still won the game. And still yeah. won the game. That's so, the first time ever. Pretty yeah. amazing. And, and uh, the New York Giants are just sad. But, but Malik Neighbors had a good day. So. Yeah. Um, Good for them. We, we need to do that. 10 maybe, catches a touchdown. Maybe do like a Tigers in the Pros segment on Mondays. Yeah, maybe we should start doing that. It's not a terrible um, idea. No, this is a college football show. But what we're, what, <laughs> what we're doing now is certainly college football. We're going to go around the SEC and our around the SEC segment is brought to you by Classic Industrial Services because at Classic Industrial Services, every moment matters. And as we know in the SEC, it just means more. So what did you guys make of some of the SEC happenings this weekend? Um, Wilson, your Georgia Bulldogs got a scare it seems like they never play well in Lexington, though. No, they don't. Um, you look back at the last few years, they were showing some of these stats, uh, how low the scoring outputs have been in Kentucky uh, for Georgia. Is um, I guess there was one game where it was like extremely, extremely cold, and they scored 16 points a few years ago. I think it was maybe 2022. And then 2020, they didn't score a lot, too. Kirby Smart always says for Georgia going into that game, like Kentucky's whole identity is trying to be physical and all of that. Um, but it was shocking to see it be this year after how South Carolina beat Kentucky. So it was kind of funny today when Brian Kelly, I don't remember exactly what the question was, but he goes like, well, I guess if you really want to play the transitive property game, like, you know, uh, we would beat Georgia if uh, because they beat South Carolina. They South Carolina beat Kentucky. Yeah. Yeah. You never hear a coach say stuff like that. <laughs> he, was, but he, he was joking. joking. I, I, I know, but... You're just you're just asking for he was, he's asking thing. for yeah. for uh, yeah internet uh, trouble on that one. Um, but sometimes Kelly tries to make those sorts of jokes. Um, they don't always land. Sometimes they do. Um, in this case, I think it was sort of conveniently overlooked. But anywho, um, <laughs> <laughs> until right now, uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, so you know, it's Kentucky. I think it shows. It did honestly. It did it was kind of a good thing for LSU because it shows that it's really hard to win on the road in the SEC. You uh, any week, sort of any given week, somebody can lose, and um, you know maybe uh, maybe like you said earlier, this turns into a really good win for LSU to beat a South Carolina team that just did that to to that Kentucky team because yeah, Georgia was just all out of sorts. Their offense has to get a lot better if they're going to be um, you know a true national championship contender. Uh, we're talking about you know work that LSU has to do. They got to do a lot of work before they go to Bama in two weeks, then before they go to Texas, and then before they go to Ole Miss. Uh, that was probably my main SEC takeaway from the week is just that Georgia's offense. Um, has to get going. It, might, it has a lot of good players. I'm not sure it has a singular great player now that they don't have Brock Bowers and Lad McConkey. Yeah. yeah. Um, the other conference game this weekend was Texas A&M and Florida, Koki. And Texas, mm. Texas A&M beating Florida in and of itself is not like an indictment of Billy Napier. Texas A&M, I think, has a good team. Um, but the natives are beyond restless now in Florida. His hot seat has reached a boiling point. The, was it the board of curators, whoever it was, had a meeting on Sunday uh, presumably about Billy Napier's job. It doesn't seem like he's long for that position. Yeah. Um, if there are any Rage Cajun fans watching the stream, it's uh, it's not going great for... Tell us if for, you take him back. Leave it in the comments. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's uh, not going great, going great for Billy over in Gainesville. Um, it just seems like it's absolute chaos over there. Uh, I mean, they're, they, they were changing quarterbacks. It's all, like seemingly, it seemed like almost every uh, every drive in that game against Texas A&M. And um, they weren't doing a whole lot to stop an A&M team that was you know, playing there, had to play their backup quarterback because of Wickman's injury either. So um, I, I think A&M is a good team. Uh, I think they've been wildly underrated in the polls so far this season. Uh I've been consistent as as a as a voter. I've been consistently ranking them in the top twenty, um, and just this week they got into the top twenty five. So again, I don't understand. Uh, but it's uh, but but yeah, like I, either way though, like Florida can't look this hapless against Texas A and M and Miami. They've got to be at least competitive, especially in year three. Like we've talked about all the problems that Brian Kelly and LSU has has had in year three, but those are nitpicks in comparison to what's going on at Florida. Like nitpicks because. They are worse than they were three years ago. Somehow, with, when you have, the, despite there being the transfer portal, despite you, you having at least some NIL money, you know, despite like three, two, three years of recruiting, and you somehow have a worse team, it doesn't make any sense. And uh, that's just kind of the state of Florida right now. It's very puzzling. Well, here's here's a question for you guys: Is Billy Napier the coach when LSU plays there in November? I, I don't think he is, I, man. I don't I, think there's any way well, that and, happens. And that, I was actually just looking this up. They they go to Starkville this week, which that's going to be oh, it's going to be the grossest of dumpster game. fires. Yeah, Mississippi State lost by thirty. 
five points was it to, to Toledo, or maybe they scored at the end and it was only twenty eight points. They yeah. got blown out by a MAC team at home um, after paying them, uh, I think one point two million dollars yeah. to come play. Yeah, I, I I think they'll beat Mississippi State. So like, it, I, yeah, I, they play Mississippi <laughs> State. Then they, get, they have a non conference game, not not a gimme against UCF at I home. I think they'll lose that game. And, UCF's a good team. And then they've got Tennessee, Kentucky, Georgia, Texas, LSU. <laughs> No, Billy that's, Napier, not, even, that's not even the end of the season. No, it's remember. not the end yeah. of the season. I mean, then they, then they play Ole Miss and Florida State. Well, Florida State, but <laughs> but but I mean, like just to get to LSU, there's at least three more losses in there. I mean, we've talked all summer about how difficult their schedule was, and they can't even be competitive against some of these teams at home. Uh, it's it's not a good situation. So, elsewhere on the SEC. Um, Vanderbilt, the blooms off that rose. They lost to Georgia State. We talked about Mississippi State, Missouri. Competitive game survived yeah, I was about, Boston College. I was about College. to say, I'm sorry yeah. you haven't mentioned Missouri yet. The, the 27-21 was the final. That was another game kind of like, well, LSU was falling behind. Uh, Mizzou was down, I think, 14-3 to Boston College and had to rally. Um, and they actually had control of that game most of the second half, but it, it ended up 27-21. Um, so, you know, t- Tennessee, <laughs> Tennessee's up 30 nothing on Kent State and runs an onside kick. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that's, uh, just, that's I, mean, cool. I had a friend send me the screenshot of the halftime score of that Tennessee game, sixty-five to nothing, <laughs> and uh, she sent me like a meme of um, you know Selena Meyer like laughing nervously <laughs> um, because it's like, oh gosh, Josh Heupel has a quarterback now, and we're really going to find out a lot this weekend when them going on the road we'll to Oklahoma. Oklahoma. That'll be the Josh Heupel Bowl will be tremendous. I mean, it's hard to go up sixty-five nothing at the half on air. I don't care who they were playing. Like you, you have to be playing really well and playing, playing really fast. And then speaking of Oklahoma, they beat Tulane, um, which was an intriguing game. And Tulane got back in. I think they had a pick six and got back within a possession and actually got the ball back at one point in the fourth quarter. So it's yeah, competitive. Tulane but, might be like the best two loss team in the country because they also lost to Kansas State, but that was like a real neck and neck game. That was yeah, even sure. closer than this Oklahoma game. Um, and when it comes to the Oklahoma, like defensively, they've looked really good. It's just offensively, they've got a lot of problems. Um, especially, you know, Jackson Arnold really hasn't settled in at that at that starting spot yet for them. Yeah. So it's interesting. Uh, big weekend in the SEC. And that's brought to you by Classic Industrial Services, proudly serving Louisiana and the entire United States with high quality scaffolding erection, metal siding and roofing, thermal insulation services, refractory services, general maintenance services, large capital projects, commercial projects, small quick response needs. They're your go-to for quality and safety. Classic Industrial is not just about business. They're a proud community partner supporting local initiatives and helping build a stronger Baton Rouge at Classic Industrial Services. Every minute matters. Um, And with that, we're going to turn the page. We're going to look forward to LSU UCLA just for a few minutes. Um, We'll start that with our sports betting segment with Thomas Casale, the Queen of Baton Rouge, proudly sponsors the LSU Sports Insiders sports betting segment. Experience the thrill of game day at 1717 Kitchen and Cocktails, your premier destination for elevated sports entertainment. LSU is a big favorite against UCLA. It looks like a good game on paper. The sports books do not see it that way. And here's what Thomas thinks about that. Hey, guys. Well, LSU coming off the big win against South Carolina. This week, 22.5-point favorites over UCLA at DraftKings. Interesting, these two teams come in a combined 0-5 against the spread. But if you haven't seen UCLA play this year, they're, they might be one of the worst Power 5 teams right now. They barely beat Hawaii and got lucky to win that game. They, they lost by 29 to Indiana at home, and the score of that game would have been even worse if not for not 14 penalties by Indiana. So, listen, LSU's had a couple tough games to start the season against USC and South Carolina. They need a breather, and I think they get one this week. UCLA's on auto fade right now. I like LSU to roll at home, so I would lay the 22.5 points with LSU over UCLA this Saturday. All right, uh, Tiger fans, you can catch all the sports action at the Queen Casino's DraftKings Sportsbook Bar and 1717 Kitchen and Cocktails. With top-notch screens and live betting, it's the ultimate spot to watch your favorite teams and enjoy a cold brew or signature cocktail. The Queen Casino is the only land-based casino in Baton Rouge and your go-to for game day or any day. Visit today and elevate your sports-watching experience. Um, So, yeah, actually, it's funny. Thomas mentioned that. He said LSU's 22.5-point favorite. It's 25.5 now. So he, I think he recorded that this morning, Monday morning. It's now Monday evening. So he's obviously not the only one who's betting on LSU. 
like I said, when, when you look at the schedule and you say, oh, LSU versus UCLA, like traditionally you'd think that's a big game. It's the return game for Ed Ogeron's last season when they went to UCLA and lost in the opener. Uh, seems like a big game, but UCLA, as you mentioned earlier, Wilson, they're right up there with the Vandys and Mississippi States and Florida State as, as like the worst power five team. They're, <laughs> they're, State. they're really not very good. Yeah, no, it's just, um, UCLA has scored 29 points through two games. And it's... I I'd for, completely forgotten that Eric Bieniemy was the offensive coordinator there now. Um, you know, former Chiefs OC, uh, and you wouldn't know it because their offense has been, has been atrocious. Um, they, I, I would still probably uh, still take the over on on that spread at this point of the week. Um, I think LSU is going to uh, handle their business in this game because UCLA just doesn't seem to pose much of a threat anywhere, and them having to come to Tiger Stadium to play this game feels like. Um, I've seen some people make comments they want some revenge uh, after that 2021 opener, um, the Sissy Blue Shirts game, and I think that they will be able to get it without too much trouble uh, in this one. I forgot about that. I, I mean, different oh, yeah, coaches, different that. teams, I, I, but I get for it. The fan base, it's, <laughs> yeah. For the fan base, you know, for fans, it's, it's, it, it does, you know, it's still the same. Like they want to, they they want some, I think, uh, some payback after getting you know, pretty embarrassed against UCLA in that in that game. Um, Koki, this is. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. It's a get right spot for LSU. And, and I say that even though they won last week, but the theme of this whole show has been, what do you have to do to get ready for Ole Miss? And it starts here. Uh, and this is a team you should dominate. You know, Eric B I guess that the sledding's a little tougher when Patrick Mahomes is not under center for you. And, <laughs> you know, as, as your quarterback, they've struggled to score points. It, it really could be just what the doctor ordered for LSU. Yeah. Ethan Garbers isn't quite Patrick Mahomes. Um, and uh, I, I watched a little bit of that game that they had against Hawaii. Uh, the rainbow warriors kind of, it was a like fun game. Yeah, they're, yeah, it was a fun game and their defense seemed to overwhelm Garbers throughout the whole game. And, uh, Imagine what that's going to look like against LSU's athletes in Tiger Stadium. Like it's, ugh, you know, and they've only scored 20. Like you said, they only scored 29 points the whole season. Granted, that's because they've only played two games. Yeah. Um, but uh, with UCLA, like the most interesting things about them is like how weird their team in their season is going to be this year. Because like, you know, it's a first year head coach who had that very awkward press conference to start Big Ten Media Days and Deshaun Foster. Their offensive coordinator was a guy who many thought was going to be an NFL head coach by now and Eric Bieniemy. Um, defensively, I thought there were there were some suggestions that they might be decent this season, but they did, then they just gave 42 points to Indiana, so I'm not quite sure about that anymore. Um, and then you just look at the amount of traveling they have to this this season. They open the season against Hawaii. They play week week four at LSU in the Bayou. They they're probably have to go out to the East Coast at some point. They play Maryland or something. Yeah, they have Maryland like on the road, which is just wild. Like the fact that they, that that they're gonna have games like, traditional conference yeah, rivalry. Like, yeah, yeah. Maryland. Like the fact that they're going to have like games this season that are like eight, nine hours apart in terms of time zones is absolutely ridiculous. Um, and they didn't have to go to like Ireland or something to do it. So like it's uh, again, it's it's just a very strange UCLA season. One of those strangest and in, in, in that that it's one of the stranger college football seasons um, in recent memory. And, all, and oh yeah, by the way, their head coach left to become an offensive coordinator at Ohio State. So again, just a very odd situation that's going on over there. Yeah. yeah. And uh, I think the best part of this game could potentially just be the uniform matchup. Just seeing if, mm -hmm. if LSU wears white and, and not purple, then I think it'll be great. I'll be so disappointed if LSU wears purple and uh, UCLA wears white because it would ruin what is a fantastic look on the field. Okay, the, the team team captains, Brian Kelly, whoever makes that decision, Wilson Alexander's begging over here, don't wear purple this week. You're right. It would be elite uniform matchup, like, like USC Notre Dame level. Yeah, it's what Beautiful we got magic. when we went out to the Rose Bowl. It was, it was uh, you know, in the Rose Bowl and, and that powder blue and, and the LSU uniforms, which are so sharp. And, um, you know, I, I'm not like a hating like on the LSU purple uniforms. I just don't want them to wear them this game. It would clash, I think. Yeah. yeah. Save them for South Alabama. Then you can wear them South Alabama. <laughs> um, all right. We're, we're going to have a full preview of LSU UCLA on Thursday's podcast. So tune in for that here on the LSU Sports Insider. You can read these guys' work. LSU, uh, I'm sorry, theadvocate.com slash LSU. Um, also subscribe to the LSU sports at NOLA.com YouTube channel. We're growing. We post videos every day. We have some videos from today's availability with Brian Kelly up already. Um, so make sure you subscribe, tell your friends about it, all of that good stuff. Um, guys, final thoughts. UCLA's they got Southern California talent. You don't want to let that team hang around, right? I mean, you did, 
put your foot down, do what you need to do, get get better where you're supposed to get better. That that to me is the theme of this week. Absolutely. Like we kind of said earlier, we saw this, you know, the last time, you know, LSU had a game where you thought they should just be able to, you know, have a comfortable win was Nichols two, uh, two weeks ago or a week ago or so now. And that didn't happen. You need to, if you're going to be a team that is going to get to the places where LSU wants to get to, you need to go out and control games like this. This is a, an opponent that you should have overmatched. LSU should get out to a lead, continue to build on that lead and maintain it, and be a very comfortable fourth quarter. That's what I want to see out of LSU in this game because it is a better team top to bottom, I think, than UCLA is. And if they don't go and start doing those things week four like that, then that really spells trouble for when their schedule gets tougher. I still think LSU is a team that on any given day could probably beat anybody. But if you want to really get to a point where you're actually in the college football playoff race, not just sort of theoretically in the college football playoff race, you need to start dominating games like this. Um, score prediction, I'll probably, since I'm not going to be on Thursday's pot, I'd say 56-10 LSU. I think they actually, I, I think they put their foot down on UCLA in this game. And I and I think UCLA is a very poor football team. If they're going to turn over the ball a lot in this game, I that's, that's Forget what I Forget minus 25 and a half. Koki's going <laughs> minus 45 and a half. <laughs> Find that alternate spread. Yeah. Uh, all right. He's Koki Riley, Wilson Alexander. They're two of our LSU beat writers. We'll be back on Thursday's pod with Reed Darcy and Scott Ravelay. Amelia Cotton's our producer. We thank you all for watching. Thank Waste Pro and the rest of our sponsors as well. And we will see you next time on the LSU Sports Insider.